أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله إن شاء الله تعالى the next couple of hours or so uh, we're going to read through a number of ayat and a hadith as well as hear some of the words from some of the scholars that uh, were from the early times of this ummah as well as some of the latter times on the topic of the Quran reciting the Quran and then understanding the Quran and uh, in order to keep it brief inshallah we won't read everything but we hope to mention some points that if remembered will be of benefit because most of the time it's important not to know or to read a lot but to remember something small that remains with you is often more beneficial than something big that you forget because if you read a hundred books but you forget what was in them you're not going to benefit them after a while but if you read something, a book or two, and you read it well, and you revise it, and revise it again, then you remember it. You remember it when you're in the street, you remember it when you're at home, you remember it when you're in the masjid. So, something small that remains is better than a lot that is forgotten. Normally, when we speak about virtue of the Quran, what's the first thing that comes to a person's mind or to somebody's mind? Yes. The reward, the hadith mentioned, the reward of reading each letter. Naam. Anything else, any other hadith that you can remember or that comes to your mind? Thinking and pondering over it, mm -hmm. over the Quran. What does the word virtue mean? Benefits. Okay. Anybody else use virtue in their normal day to day language other than this subject? But sometimes we use words that we only use when we hear it in a khutbah or we study books, but we don't really use that word. So in Arabic we say fadl or the fadail or something, right? So in English when we say virtue, what we mean is the extra goodness, the extra uh, niceness, the extra uh, blessing that something has. I.e. the Quran has a lot of blessing within it. So when we say virtue, it means the extra goodness that it has. And it can also be the extra goodness that a person derives from it in terms of the reward. As the brother mentioned, the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu that for every letter, a person gets 10 rewards. So there are many a hadith that you, we are familiar with, that we have heard. The best of you is he who learns the Quran and teaches it. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam also mentioned uh, uh, that the person who reads the Quran uh, beautifully or proficiently is with the noble angels. And the person the person who struggles with it and it is difficult upon him he has two rewards or as the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mentioned. So these are hadith that we hear about. So I won't focus too much on those hadith, but I want to discuss something else that sometimes we may take for granted, although it is very important. If someone said to you, what is the Quran? What would you say? Non-Muslim friend, classmate said to you, what's the Quran? Well, you have to give an answer that's, that's good. Because he's not going to be able to tell you, you sure? Because he doesn't know. You. The words of Allah. Okay, so what is the Torah? What is the Injil? So we need the word, we need the definition that we understand exactly, not mixed with anything else. So the words of Allah is true, but it's not precise enough. We need to add something. Okay, but that's, we need something more detailed than that. There? The Islamic Book of Guidance, good.
Good, we're getting closer. So the final book of Allah, which was a guidance for all of humanity. I think that's pretty close enough. So normally it, it surrounds the fact that it's a revelation. It's the speech of Allah. And it's revealed to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And you find the scholars then will add that the, the recitation of which is an act of worship in and of itself to distinguish it from a hadith or a Qudsi, as some of them refer to. طيب. When we look at the Quran, the greatest, you could say, virtue or thing that stands out with regards to the Quran is, as the brother mentioned, that it is the speech of Allah. Sometimes we say something so often, we don't appreciate its value. Like, for example, at a human level, sometimes we see our mother so often, it's only when we really think about how much she's done for us that we appreciate her, right? But when she's not there that we appreciate her. Sometimes, because we've grown up with the Quran, we don't really appreciate how full of blessing it is. Imagine if you had a life where you didn't know what was right and wrong. You didn't know who your creator was. You didn't know what you were here for. It would be an empty life. Some of you that became Muslim, perhaps you've been through that. You wanted, you knew that there was a creator because when you look to the skies, you see stars, you see the, the universe, and you realize that there has to be a creator for this. But you don't know why you're here. So when we say that the Quran is a book of guidance, we have to really taste that. Because Alhamdulillah, we have the guidance there, we, we don't really realize. Because we have the light there, we don't realize how dark darkness is. So from the greatest of virtues of the Quran, is that it is the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned, وَإِنَّهُ لَتَنزِيلُ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ نَزَلَ بِهِ الرُّوحُ الْعَمِينَ عَلَىٰ قَلْبِكَ لِتَكُونَ مِنَ الْمُنْثِرِينَ Verily, this is the Quran, or this Quran is a relation from the Lord of the world, of the world, of Al Alameen, which is the tr with which the trustworthy ruh came down with upon your heart, O Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam mentioned that he hopes to have the greatest amount of followers because of this Quran. He mentioned, An Abi Hurairah radiyallahu taala anhu. أن رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم قال ما من الأنبياء من نبي إلا قد أعطي من الآيات ما مثله ما مثله آمن عليه البشر وإنما كان الذي أوتيت وحيا أوحى الله إلي فأرجو أن أكون أكثرهم تابعا يوم القيامة it has been narrated in the authority of Abu Hurairah radiallahu ta'ala anhu that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said there has never been a prophet that have been sent from amongst the prophets except that he was given a sign through which people believed in them. And I have been given or my sign is the revelation that has been sent upon me. And I hope that I will have the greatest amount of followers on the day of resurrection. Musa alayhi salam was given signs that his people saw. Isa alayhi salam was given signs that his people saw. The Prophet sallallahu was given signs that his people saw. There were many miracles that occurred in the life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. But we can't see those miracles. We read about in the narrations. We hear about those miracles and blessings that he had. But the miracle that we do see, the sign that we do see is the Qur'an. And sometimes a person who doesn't know the Qur'an says, but it's a book. How is it a miracle? But the person who looks into the Qur'an and pays attention to it, pays attention to it and strives to understand it, not just recite it, will see that it's the greatest of signs. That there was no way that the Prophet ﷺ could have come up with it himself and there's no way that it could have been from any human so when a person looks at it and studies its tafsir then he comes to understand that this is the greatest of signs that the Prophet Sallallahu received and that's a big virtue that the Quran has secondly another way to know the virtues of the Quran is to look at how Allah described the Quran himself in the Quran 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first and foremost connects it to himself. He says, uh, inna an, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala connects it to himself. He says, Alhamdulillah alladhi anzala ala abdihi al-kitaba wa lam yaja'allahu iwaja. All praise and thanks is due to Allah who sent upon his servant the book. He praised himself, Allah praised himself. Why? Because he sent this book to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa indicating that it's something great. Likewise, Allah says, الَّذِي نَزَّلَ الْفُرْقَانَ عَلَىٰ عَبْدِهِ Blessed is he who sent the criterion, the furqan, the, the book that helps you distinguish between right and wrong upon his servant. Likewise, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes the Qur'an as the rope of Allah. وَاَعْتَصِمُوا بِحَبْلِ اللَّهِ جَمِيعًا وَلَا تَفَرَّقُوا And hold on to the rope of Allah fastly, I tightly, all together and do not separate, do not become separated. A rope that reaches to where? A rope that reaches and guides you and pulls you to salvation. And this rope, as Allah mentioned, has to be held onto. A point, something that we all need to focus on and understand, especially in this time, which is a painful time for all the Muslims that have Iman in their hearts. When they see their brothers and sisters going through great difficulty and you cannot do much of what you wish you could do. At this time, it's important for the Muslims to strive towards unity. As Allah mentioned, وَلَا تَفَرَّقُوا Do not become divided. But notice that Allah said, hold on to the rope of Allah. I.e., this unity that we have to have as an ummah can only come, is only from holding on to the rope of Allah. It's not a unity that is based upon my culture or your culture. It's not a unity that is based upon my feelings or your feelings. It's not a unity where we say, it's okay, you can do something that is not right, let's just be brothers. No, it's a unity where we both of us are holding on to the rope of Allah. So the unity of a Muslim can only be upon that which is correct. It cannot be a unity that is a false unity, where we just say we're united, but really inside we're not. Our hearts have something against each other. You're not from my people, I'm not from this place. No. The unity that we need to strive for has to be a unity that is based upon holding on to the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As the scholars have explained, or many of the scholars of tafsir have explained, that the hablullah here is the rope of uh, is the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala likewise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu ati'u Allah wa ati'u rasul o oh, you who believe hold on to uh, obey Allah and obey the messenger and many of the scholars here mentioned obey Allah i.e. follow the book and obey the messenger i.e. follow the sunnah of the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Another point to note, when we look at how Allah described the Qur'an, Allah mentioned that it is a nur, it is a light. What do we use light for in normal day-to-day -day life? Oh, you don't use light. You don't have a light. Sometimes you have the light on your phones. When do you turn it on? Not when taking pictures. <laughs> yes, to see. If something is dark, you don't know what, what, where to go, Sometimes maybe you don't want to step into something that is wrong. If you live uh, and there's a garden or pathway and you don't want to step where people let their dogs do their mess, you want to make sure you step on the right place, you turn the light on your phone on, isn't it? So you use the light in order to make sure that you're going the right way, in the right direction. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned that this book is a book of guidance, a light. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَكَذَلِكَ أَوْحَيْنَا إِلَيْكَ رُوحًا مِّنْ أَمْرِنَا مَا كُنْتَ تَدْرِي مَا الْكِتَابُ وَلَا الْإِيمَانُ وَلَكِنْ جَعَلْنَاهُ نُورًا وَلَكِنْ جَعَلْنَاهُ نُورًا نَهْدِي بِهِ مَنْ نَشَاءُ مِنْ عِبَادِنَا وَإِنَّكَ لَتَهْدِي إِلَى صِرَاطٍ مُسْتَقِيمٍ And thus we have sent down to you, Muhammad, or Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, a ruh, a spirit, a command, an inspiration from our command. You knew not what is, in, what is the book, nor faith, but we have made it a light wherein we guide whomsoever of our, of our servants and worshippers we wish. 
When is the last time that you had to do something in your life, make a decision, and you turn to the Quran for guidance, to illuminate and make your path right? Or do you just go ahead and do what you think is correct? When is the last time that you didn't know something and instead of Googling it and checking, you went and looked in the Quran for the answer? That's something that a person needs to put into their heart and put into their process. From the virtues of the Quran is that it's a guidance, it's a light. It helps illuminate the way. This journey that we're on that is called life, it helps you to know what is the right direction. Sometimes your parents may say, don't do this, don't do that. And you, you don't want to listen. You think they don't know. Read what happened to the people before us. It's all there in the Quran. When you read, you will understand. That light will make it clear. But sometimes we don't read until we get old. Or we just read to finish our homework and we put it back on the shelf. But we don't read to be guided. And then when we get old, then we say, Mom, Dad was right. It's true. But a smart person is the person who reads this guidance before that time. Not just that time, but beforehand. Likewise, another description, before we finish these descriptions of the Quran, is that it is a ruh, a spirit. Allah described as a ruh, an inspiration. We are made up of as humans, you as a person, made up of two things. They are? Don't look at your friend. <laughs> You're made up of two things. We are made up of two things. You said something? Body, the physical body that we see, which our father was made from, Adam was made from, soil. And we have the ruh, the ruh that was breathed into us, and Adam was breathed the ruh of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that, that was breathed into him. And the angels breathed the ruh uh, into our mothers when we're fetuses. So the soil that we come from is sustained by what? Our bodies are sustained by water. What comes from the earth are the fountains, water, or veg vegetation and so forth. One of the scholars mentioned, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala <clears throat> mentioned the Quran as being ruh as or to indicate or to point to the fact that just like we have a ruh, it needs to be sustained by something. And that is the Quran. Just like our body, which is made from soil, is sustained by that which comes from the soil, likewise, our ruh is sustained by our recitation and our connection and our awareness of the Quran. So all these descriptions that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to the Quran, we should try this Ramadan to when we read, when we do a khatma, which many of us read from start to end, try to stop in these places. How has Allah described the Quran? And then ask ourselves, how have we lived up or used this description? How are we with regards to this point that is being made? If the Quran is a nourishment for the soul, then how nourished or malnourished are we? Why is it that we spend, I don't know how much people spend now, but 40 pound, 50 pound on protein shakes and gain and this and that to make the body look good. But we don't spend near, nearly half as much on Quran lessons to make sure that our recitation is hitting us, to make sure we understand what we're reciting. Which one is a greater investment? We all know the answer. But putting it into practice is what we need to do. So a person needs to remember that the Quran, from its virtue, is the many things or the many aspects that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has described it as being. Another way to focus on the virtue of the Quran is that it leads its contents, that it leads the person to know in Allah. It leads the person to know in Allah. Again, this is something that perhaps we don't think about. We maybe take for granted. But imagine, you, imagine at a worldly level, you start a new job. Or you're working at a company 
and someone says, you know what, there's a the new boss is coming. What are you going to think? The company's just been bought out and they're going to bring a new boss. What are you going to think? You're not going to think anything? I'm quitting. <laughs> huh? You will think he's a good person or bad person. You will wonder, isn't it? Say, oh, I'm going to have to work extra. Is he going to make me do overtime? Is he going to, is he going to let me come to Juma? You're going to think a lot of things. How about your Lord? Shaykh ibn Uthami rahimahullah ta'ala mentioned, when a person reads Surah Al-Fatiha, Allah says, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. All praise and thanks is due to Allah, the Rabb, the Lord of al Alameen of the creation. So when a person hears that, he knows now that he has a Lord. Just like if you had a boss, you'd think, like the uncle said, what type of boss is he going to be? Is he going to be difficult? Is he going to be easy? Is it how? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as of all his names and attributes that he chose to describe or to introduce himself with, what did he choose in the next ayah? Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim. This Quran helps us to know who our creator is. That's not something small. Just because we've known all of our life, don't take it for granted. Allah chose to introduce himself as Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim. Ibn Uthami, rahimullah, mentions as though the person hears that he has a Lord, he will ask what type of Lord, how will his dominion be established? He's going to be the Lord. How is he going to deal with us as his creation? And he chose subhanahu wa ta'ala to mention two names of his that are connected to the attribute of mercy. Thus indicating that this, this dominion, this rulership, this kingdom that he will have, that he is a Lord that is merciful. And that should give a person hope. That's from the virtues of this Quran. That it helps a person to understand who his Lord is. And when a person understands who his Lord is, then he can understand who he is. We cannot understand who we are truly until we understand why we're here. What does Allah want from us? And who Allah is. Also, from the, guide, from the virtues of the Quran, and this is one that is of utmost importance as well, is that it guides to the way which is best. إِنَّ هَذَا الْقُرْآنَ يَهْدِي لِلَّتِي هِيَ أَقْوَمْ Verily, this Quran guides to that which is most just and right. Easy words. But in practice, we realize that sometimes we don't think of it this way. Allah says this is haram. The professor, the GP, this person, the person on, I don't want to mention apps, social media apps, but whatever social media app people use, says, oh, 10 health benefits of this. Allah says it's not allowed. And this person tells you there's 10 health benefits of this. Or that if you do this and then do this, you can get X amount of wealth. And so you start to look, oh, maybe it's not interest. Maybe it's not river. Maybe I can do it this way. And you try to find shortcuts. Whilst you don't realize or whilst we forget, Satan makes us forget, that Quran guides to the best way. Not this advert here, not this person here, the Quran. So it's easy to say that it guides to that which is best, but we have to really believe that. Not that when you hear a hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, do this, this and this, fast three days in a month. We didn't get to that hadith. But fast three days in a month. He said, mm, okay, maybe I will do it. But when someone says, oh, look at this video, intermittent fasting, it helps you with your metabolism and you're going to get a six pack or whatever, then you start doing it. And then some people smart and they say, ah, oh, Muslims, we knew it a long time ago. Okay, we knew, but did we do it? So we have to ask ourselves, when Allah or the Prophet ﷺ mentions something, are we quick to rush to it? Or we try to find excuses. And when someone says, oh, this, this benefit or this person who has this qualification says something, then we say, oh, yeah, yeah, it's true, we should do it. And we rush. So now this virtue of the Quran, that it guides to that which is best, 
is not something to be taken easy, lightly. If you really believe that it guides to that which is best, why would you not read it? Why do you read seven habits of successful people in order to become successful? But yet when it comes to Quran, you just read it quickly just to finish your homework. If you read it and you don't really understand it. But these other books, self-help books, you read hundreds. And Quran is on the side. No, we have to really put in mind that this Quran guides to that which is best. Really believe it and really put it in practice. Likewise, from the virtues of the Quran is that it contains the best of stories, the most truthful of stories and the most beneficial of stories. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned وَمَنْ أَصْدَقُ مِنَ اللَّهِ حَدِيثًا And who is more truthful than Allah in speech? And he mentions نَحْنُ نَقُصُّ عَلَيْكَ أَحْسَنَ الْقَصَصِ We verily, we mention to you or narrate to you the best of stories. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions لَقَدْ كَانَ فِي قَصَصِهِمْ عِبَرَةٌ لِأُولِي الْأَلْبَابِ Verily, there is in the mention of their stories or is in their stories a lesson to be learned for those who have understanding and intellect. How many stories of the Quran do we really know? If I ask you how many series is on this place or that place or uh, how many of, I don't know, the episodes of such and such, you know, some people, they've memorized everything. But the stories in the Quran, we kind of know a little bit. Why? These are the most beneficial of stories. They impact us in the best of ways. They are the role models. Role models for every time and place. From the best of people, the prophets and messengers, and the righteous, and the stories of those that were opposite than that, so that we can keep away from what they've done. But, if a person doesn't take time to learn these stories, which is one of the greatest virtues of the Qur'an, understanding this path that we're on and how other people have lived this path and what was the consequences of their actions so that we can either do them, I do that thing if it was good or keep away from it if it was bad. If we understand that, then for surely we will spend more time reading it and understanding. We'll mention a couple of ahadith uh, here inshallah ta'ala which are to do with virtues of the Qur'an that we're more familiar with. So what we mentioned previously was to do with uh, different aspects that we can benefit from the Qur'an and how it's, it's a virtue from that aspect. Now we mention a couple of ahadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam wherein he mentions a virtue or benefit that is connected to reciting the Qur'an. From the ahadith he says, اِقْرَأُ Quran. فَإِنَّهُ يَأْتِي يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ شَفِيعًا لِأَصْحَابِهِ Read the Qur'an. For verily it will come on the day of resurrection as an intercessor for his companion. Another hadith similar to it says, يَأْتِي يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ أو يُؤْتَى يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ بِالْقُرْآنِ وَأَهْلِهِ أَلَّذِينَ كَانُوا يَعْمَلُونَ بِهِ فِي الدُّنْيَا تقدمه سورة البقرة وآل عمران تحاجان عن صاحبهما The Quran and its people who applied it will be brought on the day of resurrection and they will be preceded by سورة البقرة and آل عمران which I, these two will argue on a person will argue on behalf of a person who accompanied it Okay, the companion means the one who knows it, applies it, and so forth. Okay, what was different between these two? What was different between these two hadith? What was something extra other than the mention of Baqarah and Ali Imran? One says, Read the Quran because it will come on the day of resurrection as an intercessor for its companion. And the other one says, The person of the Quran and the Quran will be brought on the day of resurrection. Or the Qur'an and the person of the Qur'an who used to act by it you be, will be brought on the day of resurrection. Well, there's something in the second that is extra to the first. Which is? Good. The action. 
So what we understand when we look at the hadith of the Prophet wasallam all together is that it's not merely the mere recitation. Yes, the recitation of the Quran has a reward. But it's important that a person acts upon it. So it's not merely just sounding nice, being melodious. That's one aspect. But the person also has to ensure that he tries his best to act upon it. No one's going to be an angel. You're not going to be perfect. You're not going to go walk out of any madrasa and come out you're not a sinner. I.e. you're not going to make mistakes. Everybody's going to make mistakes, but how in much are you improving? Are you acting, are we acting upon what we read? So now, uh, the... Another point that can be taken, when the Prophet ﷺ mentioned اِقْرَأُ quran Read the Qur'an Did he mention when to read the Qur'an? No So the fact that he ﷺ left that unmentioned is means that it's unrestricted i.e. read the Qur'an in all situations in all times The only exceptions are in those times that have been mentioned as being exceptions like when a person is in a state of janaba or what is known when a person is in a place where Allah is not meant to be mentioned like the bathroom and such other places when we say acting upon the Quran the Quran is either information or is going to be rules and regulations so acting upon the information is attesting what has been attested or affirmed and negating what Allah has negated. When Allah mentions something happened, believing that it happened. When He mentions that it didn't happen or something um, did not occur, then believing that it didn't occur. That's with regards to the information. When it comes to the rules and regulations, then applying them. Applying them in their proper places. The purpose of the Quran being revealed is that it's meant to be acted upon. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned. كِتَابٌ أَنزَلْنَاهُ إِلَيْكَ مُبَارَكٌ لِيَدَّبَّرُوا آيَاتِهِ وَلِيَتَذَكَّرَ أُولُو الْأَلْبَابِ A book, I, this book, this Qur'an is a book which, which, have, which we have sent to you and it is Mubarak, full of barakah a great goodness, a lot of goodness, كَثْرَةُ khair. Then Allah says لِيَدَّبَّرُوا Li means for the purpose I, we sent this book down so that they would ponder, would think, would over, I pondering, ayati, it's ayat. And that the people of knowledge may remember. The point then in the point then is that the Quran will come as an intercessor, pleading Allah that the person who used to read it and act by it should be forgiven, should be pardoned. Likewise, the famous hadith that all of us uh, have heard before, wherein the Prophet ﷺ is reported to have said by Uthman, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, خَيْرُكُمْ مَنْ تَعَلَّمَ الْقُرْآنَ وَعَلَّمَهُ The best of you is he who learned the Qur'an, or learns the Qur'an and teaches it. Here, khayrukum means the best of you, the whole ummah. Again, it's something that we all hear, we all know. But how many of us, how many of us really, really uh, want to implement this, want to apply this? Do we teach our kids, when you grow up, I want you to be a person of the Qur'an? Yes, I want you to have a, you know, a career, whatever you want to have as a career, X, Y, Z. But I want you that, that you are half of. I really want you to memorize the Quran and act by it and understand it. How many of us say that? Maybe we say, oh, I'm old when I was younger, I didn't have the opportunity. Okay, I'm busy now, I have responsibility. But how many of us say that with regards to our kids? We drive this point home when you grow up, when I get older, I want to be a person who knows the whole Qur'an properly, who can read it and who understands it. 
just mentally preparing the person for that. It's not necessarily that everybody's going to have the ability to do it. But I'm pretty sure if we worked hard and we just shifted our mindset, a lot of us would. Because, because it's not the Quran, it's not a matter of being intelligent. There are many students that we have in our madrasa, they are not intelligent. I, above average, but they know a lot of Quran. Number one, it's a blessing from Allah. And from the aspect of our actions, it's consistency. The main factor that will tell you if you can learn the Quran in terms of memorizing is consistency. It's not being smart, it's not having a great memory, it's not, uh, not working, I, can only, I can't work, I have to just, no, no, it's consistency. If you do a page a day, uh, a page a week, in one week, one page, you can memorize Quran, you can finish. But you just have to be consistent. But is that consistency? Sometimes we may think, but it's true, but why can't I do it? Because Allah told us, we have an, we have an enemy. Shaitan doesn't want you to do it. That's the number one reason. And Allah knows best. I can't say maybe it's the nafs as well. But for most people, I believe that's the number one reason. We don't understand that Shaitan is an enemy to us. So when we go home and we sit down and we want to relax, we have to think, why? Why are we like this? If we, are we really tired? If we're really tired, why well, we, don't, we don't sleep? But we're not tired, we're half tired and half want to watch this and we want to relax and, and we want to catch up on the latest drama on this app and then we want to watch the news on this thing. We're distracted. We're distracted. Learning the Quran and teaching it comprises two things. It encompasses two things. Number one, learning the wording. And this is normally where the mind goes when people dis hear this hadith. When you hear learn the Quran, teach it, a lot of people think it means the words, which is true. But that's only part of it. The other part is learning its meaning. Learning its meaning. And as we mentioned just recently, that the purpose of the Quran being revealed is to understand it. Is to understand it and then act by it. So when we say khayrukum man ta'allam al-Qur'ana wa 'allamahu it also includes or we have to understand that it also means he who learns its meaning going to a class on tafsir reading books of tafsir reading books that explain the belief that Allah has explained in the Qur'an mentioned in the Qur'an i.e. aqeedah, what we normally in English or in the English speaking world here we mention as aqeedah or tawheed it also includes understanding fiqh when Allah mentioned like when we had in the fiqh lesson Allah mentioned in the Quran kutiba alaykum what does it mean? what is this siyam that Allah has prescribed upon us? when Allah says aqeemu salah establish the prayer, what does it mean? Understanding these things. This is part of understanding the Quran. So it's important that a person attends lessons and revises at home. Just like I know, for example, there are some people I know that when they study, when they want to study to earn money, they study very hard. And they rightly say, especially the men, they say, yeah, it's ibadah, I have to provide for my family. It's true. And sometimes they have to memorize road signs and how to get from one place to another place in the quickest time and which turn is not allowed and you have to get this car, you cannot get a car that's, you know, hybrid and it has to be... They research, they're able to research that when it comes to that topic. They spend hours. Why? Because they're going to they need to make money to survive. What about the Qur'an? It's not as difficult as that. It's not as difficult as that. 
Likewise, some people, when they have to take a test, they will work very hard to get that test. If it means that they have to go to English classes, they will go to English classes to learn, just so they can get that test, so that they can achieve something. But when it comes to Quran, you say, oh, I'm not an Arabic speaker. Okay, you were not an English speaker five years ago, but you studied, you paid money and you studied. Now you can speak English you, enough to get past. So, same with Arabic. Sometimes people learn another language, JavaScript, Python. Sometimes people learn how to read certain things they call candles. And they say, oh, there's a halal way to do investments and you can look at this and the market is going up and they spend time learning this new language, logos and symbols. Why? Because they say, ha, I need to make money, it's ibadah. What about the Quran? So learning the Quran is learning its wording and learning its meaning. Putting it in its rightful place. From that, also, before we move from this hadith, is understanding that being a Quran teacher, and this is for those people that teach Quran sometimes in madrasas and so forth, not to leave them out. It's one of the best things that a person can do with his or her life. And because we don't have a Baytul Mal here, and people perhaps don't see the importance of Quran in terms of spending money, sometimes these people that teach the Quran are people that are struggling. And many of them, if they went and worked other jobs, they will be able to earn more money. But it happens, maybe they didn't plan it, but قَدَّرَ اللَّهُ وَمَا شَافَعَلُ They became Qur'an teachers. Maybe their teacher said, you know, you should help in the masjid teach and this, and they ended up teaching Qur'an. If your situation is a situation where you never wanted to teach the Qur'an, you didn't learn so you could make money to teach, but you learned because you wanted to understand the Book of Allah. You wanted to benefit yourself to learn Qur'an. And then it so happened that you ended up teaching people the Qur'an. Then you should feel happy. And you should never feel down regardless what other people's careers are. If someone is introducing himself, okay, this brother does this, this brother does this, don't ever feel down and say, I'm a Qur'an teacher. Don't be shy to say, I teach in a madrasa. This is from the greatest of things that you can do. And in 40 years time, 30 years time, when you're old and grey, you look back and bi'ithnillah you will see people that you have taught. And that will be a, like fasting. When you fast and you break your fast, you feel happiness. There's a happiness in this dunya and there's a happiness in the akhirah. The person who's fasting, he has two happinesses. Likewise, the teacher, when he teaches Quran, he will have two happinesses. Yawm al-qiyamah, he will be happy. And when he sees his students, this boy, 10 years old, came, you taught him two Jews, three Jews, five Jews, 25, and you're getting into your 50s, 60s, and you play the pivotal role in his life. You help to connect him to the Book of Allah. We should never, as a community, we should never, ever, minimize the great effort and sacrifice that teachers of the Quran, madrasa teachers, do. Don't think, are oh, they teaching children? Teaching children is harder than teaching adults. Sometimes. And don't think, why should I teach? Even if you realize something, if you teach, of course, all of this is with the right intention. I'm not talking about teaching as a business. Uh, I'm, I'm planning to learn so I can teach and make this much money. And I'm not talking about that person. I'm talking about somebody who wanted to learn for themselves. And then circumstances occurred that he had to teach. She had to teach. That person has to realize that this is a blessing from Allah. And don't ever, don't ever, ever look at it as work. There will be sometimes you'll be tired. You don't want to come in. And you go in because it's work. But change your intention. Be proud, be happy. Proud, meaning that Allah has blessed you with it. Not proud that you are arrogant. 
Proud meaning that Allah has blessed you. And don't take it for granted. We knew many people that used to teach Quran and they stopped. And then they didn't teach Quran anymore. So don't ever take for granted that Allah has allowed you to teach His speech, His word. I don't know who the Quran teaches us, so I'm not talking to anyone in particular, but I'm just saying something that needs to be said. Because many a time, uh, it gets overlooked. Last hadith that we're going to mention, inshallah ta'ala, is that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned that there are two types of people. There are some people who read the Quran and it's very easy for them. They are proficient. Maybe because when they were young, they were taught. Such a person has a great status. His status is like that of the angels, as the Prophet Sallam mentioned. And there's another type of person who when he reads the Quran, he struggles. Some of you, if you learn how to read the Quran when you're older, you know that when you start to read Quran, you run out of breath, it's difficult sometimes. You don't know where to do the mad. You don't know where to stop. Is this a word? Is this not a word? Where can I stop? It's a struggle. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows you're struggling. Okay, at a human level, if you, uh, if you produce something, if you wrote a book, and then you see a child come, and he says, I, I read your book so many times. And it's not in my language, but it's difficult for me. But I read it. Would you feel happy that he took time to read what you wrote, even though it wasn't in his language, and even though it's difficult for him? You would. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is much higher than we can imagine. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned, وَلِلَّهِ الْمَثَلُ الْأَعْلَى and he said, Laysa kamithlihi shay. There's nothing like Allah. And to Allah is the highest example. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is more generous and more uh, compassionate, ra'uf, than we can ever be. When he sees a person struggling, or when he knows a person is struggling in reciting the Quran, but that person still tries because they know the value that it has then that person will be rewarded extra. So don't ever think, no matter what situation you're in, if you're somebody who can recite it proficiently, then know that your status is going to be high in the sight of Allah. And if you're somebody who is struggling to read, then realize that your reward is doubled. Your reward is doubled. And with practice, you will attain proficiency bi idhnillah. A lot of practice and a little bit of guidance from a teacher, bi idhnillah ta'ala, you will get there. Okay, some etiquettes with the Quran. Now we've understood or we looked at some of the reasons why we should be reading the Quran and, and memorizing the Quran and understanding the Quran. Then the scholars also discuss some etiquettes that we should have with the Quran. Some of these etiquettes are to do with the body, the outer aspects. And some of them are to do with the inner aspects that a person should be paying attention to. Number one, from the things that we need to keep in mind when we read the Quran, is that it is the speech of Allah. That it is the speech of Allah. And just like we said that that is the, from the virtues of the Quran, likewise, then all of these etiquettes that we're going to mention are connected to this. It's not something, it's not like reading any other book. As such, we have to pay extra attention and be extra uh, vigilant with regards to how we deal with it. When a person reads a book in English or in any subject, does he ever read a book just to read it? Or does he read a book with a goal? Have you ever seen a book, a person reading a book just to read it? 
Maybe you have, but it's not normal. Yeah? Normally, the, the reason they read is because there's an exam, or some people read for pleasure, unusual, but they just read because they enjoy reading. Yes? But normally, you find that also they read to understand. As Ibn Taymiyyah mentioned in his Muqaddimah, the Usul tafsir he said that the Aada, in Aada of the people, is that a book is read to be understood. So, from the manners and etiquettes of the Quran is that we read it, is that we read it and we try to understand it. That we don't just read it just to mimic the words, but we also try to understand it. Likewise, what follows on from the fact that it's the speech of Allah is that we don't read it or learn it to make money. We don't read to eat by it. That shouldn't be our intention. It's an act of worship, and that means that it should be solely for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. With regards to before reading, then there are certain aspects that should be adhered to. Some of them are obligatory, some of them are recommended. From them is that a person should purify himself. That a person should purify himself. And purification includes spiritual purification, which is that a person has the right intention, and that he's not seeking anything from the dunya, or to be heard by the people, or showing off. And number two, it includes also purification from physical things, such as not being in a dirty place, making sure that one's clothes are clean and also purification in terms of not being in a state of janaba and avoiding being in a state of minor ritual impurity i.e. a person can read the Quran while he is uh, while he doesn't have wudu but ideally there should be times in our life where we sit and read the Quran in a better way, i.e. just because something is allowed doesn't mean we do it. If we understand that the Quran is a speech of Ar-Rahman, then we understand we should have an idea or a need or desire to want to read it in the best of ways. So for example, when you go and meet someone important, do you go in your pajamas? No. Normally you will dress up nicely, you will smell good, you will uh, you will not be in a state that is unkept. Likewise, for example, when we come to Salah, no one says to you that it's obligatory for you to come in Salah looking the best. But if we have this idea, if we have, had the, if we have this understanding that we're coming to stand in front of Allah, and that we are in conversation with Allah, as was in, uh, mentioned by the Prophet Sallallahu and that when we recite the Quran in the Salah, Allah has split it between Himself and the servant into two parts. I've divided the Salah between my servant and myself into two parts. So we are conversing with Allah. If we understand that, then we're going to go in the best of ways. We're not going to say, I don't have to smell good, I don't have to. Okay, maybe you can say, I don't have to, it's not wajib. But why would you not? When you go to a meeting with someone important, what do you normally do to your phone? You put it on silent? It's different generations. See, the older generation will say we turn it off. The younger generation say we put silent. Yeah? So you either do one of two. You don't want to disrupt the person in front, you know, the important person you're with. Why with Allah we're neglectful? We're neglectful. We rush to the salah. When we want to go to somewhere important, we have an appointment. Do we go early or do we just try to just on time? We go early because we don't want to miss it. Why are we to salah? We're just on time. We have to learn to look at our, our life different. We have to really look at our life different. If you're going to go to a football match, you want to play football or whatever the youngsters do nowadays, you're going to tell your parents, quickly, quickly, we're going to be late, we're going to be late. Even though you're early. Why? Because it's something you want. But with Salah, sometimes we say, ah, oh, later, ah, oh, we still, it's quarter past. 
don't worry, it's, it's, we still got time. We catch the first rakah. Why? You're missing the salah. The Prophet Sallallahu used to find coolness in the salah. We just want to finish, make sure we finish it quickly. That's incorrect. Likewise with the Quran. Some of the scholars they will mention, it is the student or the recite of the Quran should sit as if he is sitting in front of his teacher when he recites. Sadly, some of us nowadays, when we sit in front of the teacher, we, <laughs> it's not a good way, it's not a good example to give. Yeah? But what it means is, when you sit in front of someone, out of respect, you sit, you, you look good, you smell good, you sit humbly, and you recite. Okay, sometimes you'll be lying down to do your adhkar. Sometimes you're tired, but you need to do your rev revision. That's fine. But there, will be, there should be some times in your week when you actually sit consciously and sit to read the Quran. Not that you're just doing it as something that you have to do as part of the day, but you actually sit and go and read it. Likewise, from the etiquettes of the Quran or reading the Quran is the place that a person is going to sit. Where are you going to read the Quran? Yes, yeah, sometimes you're in a rush. You have to, on your way to work, on your way back, in the car, that's fine. But there should be some times where you're de dedicating that time to reading Quran. Your free time, not your side time. Where do you read the Quran? So they will mention all the different places that they mention. They'll say, for example, not near a river, not near a garden. What do they mean by all these things? Don't be somewhere that's going to distract you. That's what the, the main meaning is. Sometimes they don't read by the window. Why? Because you sit by the window and read, you see something go past, you this. So you get distracted. What would we add here in this day and age? Don't read from your phone. That's more distractful than a window, than a river, than anything, because your phone has everything. Some people say, oh, can I read my Quran from a... No, have your mushaf. You read from, from your phone when you're on your way somewhere, when you're waiting for something. Yes, have it on your phone, it's fine. But when you want to sit and actually read, read from your mushaf. Have a mushaf for yourself. Because when you come on your phone, 99... Uh, okay, most, I think... It's safe to say 99% of people, a notification will come. You start reading, someone will notify you, something, one of the groups that you're in, or your parents, someone will come and message or do something. Someone will send you a joke, someone will send you an invitation to come play a game, and then you, what will happen? Even if you carry on reading, you're going to try to finish so you can go. Even if you're going to carry on, that's if you're going to carry on. Sometimes I'll do it later on you, and go to play FIFA. Means you've lost out. Likewise, they say the timing, the timing of reading from the etiquette of the Quran is suit, choosing a suitable time. What's the best time to read the Quran? Night time or after Fajr, just before Fajr? From the benefits of that time is. Yes, from the benefits of that time is that no one will see you. So it's more closer to ikhlas. Also from the benefits of that time is that there's less distractions. Most people are sleeping. And also from the benefits of that time is that the Prophet ﷺ told us that Allah descends in the third, last third of the night. So being engaged in istighfar and dua is highly recommended. From the etiquettes now, when we talk about that was before reading the Quran, so being pure with your body, being in a good place, being in the right time. When reading the Quran, we should begin with the isti'adha. As Allah mentioned, فَإِذَا قَرَأْتَ الْقُرْآنَ فَاسْتَعِذْ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ When you read the Quran and seek refuge in Allah from shaitan, the accursed. Why do we seek refuge from Allah, from shaitan? Why do we seek refuge that Allah protects us from shaitan? Good, so he doesn't whisper in our ears, so he doesn't confuse us, so he doesn't distract us. One of the scholars mentioned, he said, instead of you struggling with the shaitan, you ask help from Allah. He said, it's for example, it was Ibn Qayyim and he was quoting Ibn Taymiyyah. Uh, he was quoting Ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahumallah. Rahimahumallah. He said, if you see a man with a 
with a, uh, a dog, a shepherd with a dog. And a dog comes to attack you. Are you going to sit and fight with the dog to try to get him off you? Or are you going to just tell the shepherd to come and take the dog? What would be easier? Yes. If you tell the shepherd to control his dog, then the shepherd will just do a whistle or whatever they do. And he will take the dog. He was given this as an example uh, to us when we ask Allah to protect us from shaitan. Sometimes shaitan will come and we're fighting, fighting, fighting. But this phrase, especially if a person has the awareness, i.e. he is conscious when he is saying it. It's not just saying, I'll be he is actually conscious of it. Then he will find that Allah will control the shaitan. Allah will keep the shaitan from him. But as with any dua, it should, for it to have the greater effect, then a person has to be conscious. I.e., sometimes we just make dua, we ask for something, and we just move in our tongue. It's good that we're doing that, but the greater thing is that we're aware and conscious of what we're saying. So we're aware that we're asking Allah to protect us from the shaitan. We're aware that shaitan is going to come. We're aware that we don't want to get distracted. Likewise, from the etiquettes when reading the Quran, is that a person pauses, especially when he's reading himself, pauses when he reaches an eye of rahmah and asks for that rahmah. Or when he reaches or passes an ayah of punishment, he seeks refuge in Allah from the punishment. As this was what the Prophet ﷺ would do. Likewise, another point here, is it better for a person to read from the Mus'haf or to read from his memory? From the Mus'haf? How many agree, disagree? Anyone disagree from memory? No comment? Okay, why is it better from the Mus'haf? Not making mistakes? Okay, a Mus'haf will be uh, bear witness. Your eyes will concentrate to where you're reading. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. So the scholars differ here, or they mention different things here. And in the summary of some, some of them say, a person looks at what will, what will bring him more khushur. What will bring him more khushur. I more what will make him more conscious of Allah, what will make him have more reverence for Allah. Generally speaking, Allah knows best, when you look at the Mus'haf, there's less worry for most people. When you're reading from your memory, you have to, you're thinking about the ayat, what's coming next. Sometimes you're not sure if this ayah or that ayah, so it's true. And some of the scholars say, looking at the Mus'haf is an ibadah, but that Allah knows best, that requires evidence. I don't know myself how they're saying that, it's ibadah itself. But, look at what brings you most benefit. Obviously, if you're doing it as revision for your memorization, that, then you do it from memory. But in terms of pondering and so forth, normally speaking, having a mushaf is easier. Because when you stop to think about your reading and you want to carry on, if you're doing it from memory, it's quite hard to just stop and carry on, stop and carry on. So it's definitely is better for most people to look at the mushaf. What's better, to read fast or to read slow? But if you read fast, you finish more, more letters. You know, if you read fast, you're going to have more letters. In 20 minutes, you can read more than you read if you read slow. And more letters, more reward. You know, contemplating, okay, one, huh? Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Okay, the Prophet Sallallahu read slow and he helped with the Dabur, yes? Somebody says something? When you read, you need to have khushu. What if you can have khushu and you're reading a bit fast? You get more reward, you're going to do more letters. Okay. But you can, okay, what does that mean? Tartila, wartil tura, tartila. Mm 
Mm -hmm. Okay, what if you read... You, so now, when, you, when we read Quran, you can read bil hadr or bil tahqiq or bil tadween or tartil. But tartil meaning is a, is a pace of reading. You can read fast and still contemplate. Some of the scholars used to do that. But yes, I'm, I agree with you guys. <laughs> I agree. Reading slowly is, generally speaking, much better. If there is a reason, for example, you're doing your muraja for the day, there's a, there's a hikmah, there's a reason. But generally speaking, that you read a surah slowly is better than you read a lot fast. It's generally better than reading a lot fast. Unless there is a specific reason, as I mentioned. Sometimes in, the, in Ramadan, you may be doing a khatma. So you want to make sure you finish your khatma. In that case, there might be a reason why you go a bit faster than usual. But there's nothing to stop you from doing a khatma of reading and then do another khatma at the same time of understanding where you ponder and stop. You should do both. There's nothing to stop you from doing that. Okay. From the etiquettes of reading the Qur'an, as the Ustad mentioned, is reading slowly with tartil. I, whichever pace you read, but you're reading in a melodious and in a paced way. I, you're not reading so fast that you're missing some of the harakat or that you're just finishing like this. You're reading in a slow, melodious way. It doesn't mean slow like certain recited as read very slow. But it's slow enough that you understand what you're saying or at least that someone listening to you could understand. It doesn't feel you're rushing. With regards to Tajweed, then Tajweed has different levels to it. But it should never, focusing on Tajweed should never put someone off reading. Tajweed, the rules of Tajweed apply to the person who is able to to the person who is able to so there are some mistakes that are made with reciting the Quran that are called major mistakes for example saying one letter as a different letter or mistakes that will change the meaning these are major mistakes but this is for the person who is able so some people become Muslim or come from areas in the world where the Arabic tongue is not easy for them. The ha and the kha are very similar. So instead of saying a word with a ha, they'll say with a kh or mix between the two. In that case, if a person is like that, they should not think that they're not going to be rewarded for their recitation because they're trying. But if a person can read properly and he makes this mistake due to not caring, I is negligent, and that's the problem. Understand the difference. Because there are some people that think they're not going to read, they don't want to read because they don't want to make a mistake. And that's from the tricks of shaitan. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not burden a soul more than he can bear. So if a person tries his best and he makes that mistake, it's fine. As long as he's not teaching anybody else. Don't teach mistakes. But between you and your Lord, it's fine because you tried your best so tajweed from that angle we have to be careful don't make it too difficult for the people but if someone is learning and a teacher is strict because they know that that person can do much better and they're trying especially if they're young and they want to fix their voice then that's fine the teachers be strict for a purpose but for the general person we shouldn't be too tough because that will push people away from the Quran so that's one aspect with regard to Tajweed. Another aspect with regard to Tajweed is it should be without, what they say, takalluf, extra difficulty on the person. Sometimes you hear some people that are trying to focus on Tajweed so much that you don't enjoy the recitation. Even themselves, they don't enjoy it because they're worrying about this letter and that letter coming out like this and struggling too much. And especially when it's to mistakes, or with, especially when it's with regards to mistakes that are minor. 
And we're talking about just recitation, we're not talking about memorization. Memorizing, you have to be very careful. If you memorize it wrong, it's going to be hard to get it back. So memorization, you try your best. But when you're reciting Quran, try. But don't stop reading because you're trying to perfect one letter or one ayah. And then you end up not reading for the next 15 minutes because you're trying to fix one letter. Adhan or you okay for time? Last thing with regards to Tajweed is with regards to starting and stopping. Sometimes people they ask questions, especially people that don't know Arabic, where do I start, where do I stop? Normally there are signs in the Mus'haf, find out what these signs mean and then it will be easy. But again, don't let that stop you from reading. Don't let Tajweed stop you from reading. Read. Read. And read. You'll only get better the more you read. And for sure, if your intention is good and you're trying, then that will have a purification on your soul. It will benefit you. Don't think that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will let that go unrewarded. A couple of other points. One of the things that we should do, and perhaps we don't do often enough, or I haven't seen people do often enough, but it happened today, which was very nice, is listening to somebody else read the Quran. Especially when they're in front of you, in your presence. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi asked on more, and one, or more than one occasion a companion to read for him. Once he asked Ibn Mas'ud rahimahullah ta'ala, iqra alayya al-Qur'an, read upon me the Qur'an. And Ibn Mas'ud was shocked. Shall I read it to you when it was revealed to you? And the Prophet asked, told him to read. And he read from Surah An-Nisa, until he heard the Prophet ﷺ said, enough. And then he said, when I looked at him, I saw him and his two eyes were overflowing with tears. Another time, the Prophet ﷺ asked Ubay ibn Ka'b, if I remember correctly, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, to read. And Ubay said, did Allah mention me by name? And the Prophet ﷺ said, yes. And then he started crying. It's a, very, it's a very important thing to take your friend. Sometimes when you come to the masjid and you just read. Not because you have to memorize that surah. Not because you need to do your hizb for the day. But just read and listen. It doesn't have to be the best to read. It doesn't have to, it doesn't have to be uploaded to anywhere. Just read and listen. Take time, slow down in life, and listen. And from something that perhaps <coughs> is a difference or makes it feel different is because when you're reading, you have to worry about, not worry, but you will think about, am I pronouncing it? Am I reading it right? And so forth. You're thinking, so your mind is a bit busy. But when you hear from somebody else and you're just focusing on the reading, you have a lot of chance, you have a big chance of hearing and pondering. So take this way of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and hear the Quran be read, being read from somebody else. Likewise, as I know you mentioned Rahimahullah, repeating the ayat. Sometimes we find that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would repeat ayat for a period of time. فَإِن تُعَذِّبُهُمْ فَإِنَّهُمْ عِبَادُكْ وَإِن تَغْفِرْ لَهُمْ فَإِنَّهُ فَإِنَّكَ غَفُورٌ رَحِيمٌ uh, the ayah escapes me at the moment. He would repeat the ayah. Likewise, uh, some of the companions would repeat ayat. And this helps a person to ponder, to think. From the etiquettes of reading the Quran, and also you see it in the people before us, the prophets before us with the speech of the Lord that they received is that the person would ponder and cry. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned, أُولَٰئِكَ الَّذِينَ أَنْعَمَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِمْ مِنَ النَّبِيِّينَ مِنَ النَّبِيِّينَ مِنَ النَّبِيِّينَ مِنَ النَّبِيِّينَ مِنَ النَّبِيِّينَ وَمِنْ مَنْ حَمَلْنَا مَعَ نُوحٍ وَمِنْ ذُرِّيَّةِ إِبْرَاهِيمَ وَإِسْرَائِيلَ وَمِنْ مَنْ هَدَيْنَا وَجَتَبَيْنَا 
إذا تتلى عليه آيات الرحمن خروا سجدا وبكيا and those were they unto whom Allah bestowed his grace from amongst the prophets of the offsprings of of the offspring of Adam and those whom we carried with Nuh and the offspring of Ibrahim and Israel and from amongst those whom we guided and chose when the ayat of Ar Rahman were recited to them they fell down in prostration weeping likewise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned وقرآنا فرقناه لتقرأه على الناس على مكث ونزلناه تنزيلا قل آمنوا به أو لا تؤمنوا إن الذين أوتوا العلم من قبله إذا تتل إذا يتلى عليهم يخرون للأذقان سجدا ويقولون سبحان ربنا سبحان ربنا إن كان وعد ربنا لمفعولا ويخرون للأذقان يبكون ويزيدهم خشوعا and it is a Qur'an which, have, which we have divided in parts in order that you may recite it to men at intervals and we have revealed it by stages. Say, O Rasulullah, believe in it or do not believe in it. Verily, those who were given knowledge before, when it was recited to them, they would fall on their faces and in humble prostration. And they said, or they would say, Glory be to our Lord. The promise of our Lord must be fulfilled and they would fall down on their faces weeping and he adds or added to their humility. They used to say, read the Qur'an in, with, a, with a form of sadness, with huzn. The Qur'an, as we mentioned, is a speech of Allah, contains guidance. It's not something that uh, a person reads as if they're enjoying uh, how can I say it a person has to read it understanding the reality of life what's going to happen in life what is in front of us and what we're preparing for and some of the scholars here mention how to bring about this realization and how to focus and how to ponder when a person is reading in a manner that brings forth uh, this kind of self taken into account. And that is that a person, when he reads the ayat that have threats, i.e. when Allah mentions the punishment that is in store for those who do wrong, or that have stories about people that happened before us. A person asks himself, where am I with regards to this? Sometimes we read a story or we hear about the nations that came before us that did not follow their messenger. How many times have I not followed the messenger? The person asks himself. How many times did I know this was wrong and I didn't follow? And how am I safe from what befell the previous nations? If they didn't follow the messenger and Allah punished them, how many times in my life did I know something was wrong? I knew that I shouldn't have done that. I knew that yesterday I done this or last month I done that. And I disobeyed. What is protecting me? What is stopping me from having the same fate as those people before me? When you read or when a person reads ayat that contain a command, establish the prayer. How many prayers has a person not established? Not just prayed, but how many of them did he pray lazily in a way that Allah describes the munafiqeen? Inna al-munafiqeen fi dark al-asfal min al-nar. How many characteristics of munafiqeen do we have? When a person reads these ayat, he has to think. He has to think. Afwan. Tadhan, inshaAllah. 